Um, my name is Lynn Queen, and I live here in Batavia, and I also work at Mercy Housing, and I also attend Chapel Street Church. I have a friend that I was on leadership with for Moms Together, and she invited me to help with the fundraiser for to raise money for Mercy Housing. And I had never heard of Mercy Housing, but of course my heart just said, yes, I will help you with what you need. And I was intrigued to learn that they're my neighbors and that they need so much help. So I have three children that are in the same school district as many of these children. And I have a son who is very quiet, my youngest, and he would be asking for two sandwiches, two bags of chips, two apples. And I thought, he can't be eating all that. Finally one day I asked him, what are you doing with all this food? And he said, there's some kids that don't have lunches and I want to share mine with them. And that really touched my heart. And I thought, who are these children that he's talking about? And my daughter said that there was a boy that needed clothing. He's wearing the same thing every day. And I, I just went on with my day and didn't think much about it. And I thought, well, let's pray about it. How can we help the people? And when I came that day, I saw two of the children that I knew that my children were talking about. And I thought, there's a way I could serve them. I need to do this. So I visited and met with the property manager because I just felt this calling to see how I could help and serve here. And they offered a job and I started working shortly after. Um, I've been here three and a half years. The last time Chapel Street was here was 2019 and we had a wonderful turnout. They were able to create a second raised garden for us, which we have people that have never grown food before. We have children that have never seen how food was grown. So Chapel Street built those shelves here for us. The food pantry has shelves and we've been able to serve so many families every month from just having shelving units on the walls so that we could expand that food pantry. Now it's a full grown pantry for those who don't drive because we have many seniors and um, people who don't have a car so they're able to um, utilize our pantry and help them get through the month. So Chapel Street today for their day of serving is working on organizing our art room. They're also working on our picnic tables which we have many people that um, do love to sit outside and they've never been stained so they're rough and many splinters, lots of tears. So I have a list on my phone and I always have my phone with me and I make a list of things I see or residents needs and sometimes I just want to scream it from the rooftops. I need help with this. So um, when we were gathered today I just asked if anyone knew anything about computers and someone stepped right up. Oh my gosh I see five on! Oh wow! Are you kidding? Oh my gosh! Okay I'm gonna hug you. I don't care. I'm gonna hug you. Thank you! I am so grateful to have that opportunity to have the kids come back in the fall and say, oh, I can use the computers now. I think working here at Mercy Housing has strengthened my relationship with God in that I am His servant. I am full of joy and when people say I'm passionate, I'm honored because I know it's my passion for God that gives me that strength and grace and courage to do what I do. And I just feel like that's our calling is to help one another and serve one another. So I just pray every day that God will give me those right words or actions to take to, to serve the residents here who are my neighbors. I love that story and I love how it's just one of the many great examples of what it looks like to be a chapel on your street. And so we just wanna encourage you and push you that uh, it's so great to look back at the month of July and see all the awesome opportunities we had as a church to serve in our community. Uh, but we don't wanna just have that be a thing we did in July way back then, but we hope and encourage, wanna encourage you to continue looking for opportunities that God can use you to make an impact, both in our church, like Chapel Street Kids and all other kinds of opportunities, as well as in our local community. So thank you again for the ways in which you're serving and the ways in which uh, you are being a chapel on your street in our community around, around our, our town. Now, let's pray before we dive into God's word. Father God, we just come before you uh, this morning. God, just, just recognizing that, um, that we're all coming into this place in different seasons of life and di with different things having happened in our weeks, even in our days. Uh, and God, we, 
we come here recognizing that we need you. We need to be filled with your truth and with your hope, with your joy, with your peace, with your love. So God, now as we come to your word, God, I pray that you would speak directly to us what it is that you want each and every one of us to hear. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, some of you may know, uh, my name is Tom Ward. I'm the high school pastor here at Chapel Street, which means that every summer I have the opportunity to lead our high school students. Any high school students in the room here today? We got some of you. Uh, But I get a chance to lead high school mission trips every summer. We've had a lot of great partners throughout the years. But I think my favorite trip throughout the years has always been our trip to Ecuador, where we serve with a ministry called El Refugio. We served with them for over 20 years now. And actually, I had the chance when I was a high school kid to go on that trip. And so Ecuador really holds a pretty special place in my heart. But one of the best parts of the trip is what they call the perimeter hike, where on one of the last days, which you kind of acclimated to the altitude, uh, you wake up at like, I don't know, 4.30 or 5 in the morning, and you hike up the mountain. It's pretty much like a 2,000-foot climb, and you hike up there to go watch the sunrise, and then you hike across the perimeter of the camp, it's where it gets its name, and then back down, and it's like a two-and-a-half-hour round-trip thing, but it's absolutely awesome. And uh, This year on the hike, though, I had a few things that were kind of stacked against me a little bit. It had been a few years since I'd been to Ecuador, uh, and so I might not have been in as good of shape as my pre-dad days. I'll let you decide that. Uh, but also, I joined our team pretty late on in the trip. And so I was only in the country for like maybe 30 hours or so before we did the hike. So I wasn't acclimated to the altitude like at all. And I had just been cleared from a certain virus. So all that to say, hiking a mountain before the sun came up, it's not super fun. There was a lot of moments where I was like off on the side of the trail, uh, just like trying to catch my breath, really just gasping for air. And kids or leaders, different people would walk by and they would like look at me and make sure that I was still alive or that I was doing okay. And I was, I was trying to outwardly to, to seem, you know, encouraged and happy and cheer them on. But inwardly, I was miserable. It's like, why in the world did I choose to go on this hike after not even being acclimated to anything at all? I just remember feeling like I kind of just want to go back. Like, I just wanted to quit. I just felt completely hopeless and helpless and absolutely miserable. But eventually, by the grace of God, I think, I made it up to the peak, which is awesome. It's also really cold up there. But I made it up there, and every, all the kids were happy, and they were celebrating when I got up there. But uh, I was still kind of had a bad attitude, feeling kind of miserable. Woe is me. Why did I choose to do this? This is so hard. Uh, but, but then the sun started to rise. And I'd done this hike probably eight or ten times before, but this one was unlike any other. Like the, the clouds, there hardly were any clouds. It was the clearest I had ever seen it, and the sun was just like so bright. I, there's a picture uh, on the screen here. Of, this is some of our team worshiping on top of the mountain. The picture doesn't do it justice, but the sun was like blindingly bright. It was just absolutely incredible. And I, I remember standing up there just in awe of this just awesome view and thinking like all that pain, all that complaining, all that misery that I felt like I had just went through, like all of that, like for this, it was, it was worth it. It was absolutely amazing. You may know that we're in a summer long series right now as a church called By Faith, where we're studying Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking back to, to learn from the life and the faith of so many of the heroes of our faith. And today, we're going to continue by looking at the last little bit of chapter 11 before next week we conclude our series by looking at the first couple verses of chapter 12. And and I'll uh, I'll be up front with you today. There is a lot going on in the passage that we're going to look at. The author kind of turns a corner here at this point of the chapter. And kind of like any good preacher who's running out of time, he just tries to jam in as much content as he possibly can before he has to try to wrap things up. And so there's a lot for us to sort through together here this morning. But I think throughout it all, what we're going to see is how faith in the midst of both triumph and trial is absolutely worth it. So if you have your Bibles with you today, you can turn open to me to uh, to Hebrews chapter 11. It'll also be up here on the screen. We'll begin in verse 32 and read through the end of the chapter. Here's what it says. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, 
were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and sheeps and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect." I, uh, I wasn't kidding. There's really a lot in there, even several lists that we'll take some time to look through here this morning. But I think the first thing that we see here in that long text is an overcoming faith. An overcoming faith. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter, Raylan. She, uh, she's going to turn two next month. Actually, her favorite phrase right now, if you ask her, how, how old are you? She'll say two in September, which is... Kind of fun. Pretty cool. Uh, this is a picture from when we went to visit her grandparents for the 4th of July. And I learned on that trip that that kid loves airplanes. Like, I was pretty stressed about flying with a one-year-old. Like, I didn't want to be that dad. I didn't want to be that family on the plane. But, but really quickly, I realized that it was going to be okay because we were driving to O'Hare. We kind of got near the airport, and she started seeing planes that you know, kind of are landing, or you see some stuff off on the side of the road. And she started kind of getting excited, and she would call out, and she'd see different planes. And she's also into this song, Baby Shark. Any Baby Shark fans out there? So not only was she, like, calling it out airplanes, but she would... She would call, like, oh, this one's a baby airplane. This one's a mommy airplane. And at one point, we were on the plane. We looked out the window. We saw, like, one of those big FedEx cargo planes. And she looked at me, and she looked at the plane, and she pointed, and she said, purple daddy airplane? Which made me a little self-conscious, but I think I've <laughs> kind of worked my way through that by now. But, uh, but flying with Ray kind of made me think, it kind of reminded me a little bit just about the trust that we have in airplanes, right? Like, I have no idea how those things stay up in the sky, especially the tiny little one that we flew into Springfield, Missouri. But yet, we, for some reason, willingly stepped onto the plane, right? Because we had belief. We had enough trust that if we get on that airplane, that it will ultimately carry us to our destination. And as we begin to unpack some of these stories, I think what we see is that the same thing is true in our faith. Because faith isn't about what we can do, it's about what God can do. It's about our trust in who he is, where he ultimately can bring us. So the first thing that we see here in our text is that that faith overcomes failure. Let's look back at verse 32, it should be up here on the screens. It says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, you see, do all these unimaginably incredible things. And we'll get to those in a moment. But I think if we pause right there and we look at that list of names, my guess is in this room, there's probably some of us that that recognize some of those names. Maybe you're familiar with somebody like David or Samuel. There's probably also some names on that list that maybe you're not as familiar with. My guess is none of us were reading our Bibles this week and and stumbled upon Jephthah or Barak. But I think as we dive into these stories, what what quickly becomes apparent, what we quickly begin to see is that this is a list of people who do incredible things, but who have significant flaws. We see people like Gideon, who we know leads only 300 men to defeat a huge Midianite army, But he's a guy who starts out as a coward and doesn't trust God. And he's a guy who ends up by killing a bunch of Israelites and ultimately making an altar out of the gold that he received in battle for all the Israelite people to worship. Or Jephthah, he's a great warrior and he's a great leader. He wins many battles, but he ends up sacrificing his own daughter in a really messed up Old Testament story and eventually leads the Israelites even further into idol worship. Or Barak. He was the general under a judge named Deborah, and he had great victories in battle, but he was the guy who was consistently filled with fear. Samson, you may know him from his strength or from his hair, and his story is one that begins with lots of promise, right? He was great in battle, but he's also a guy who had significant flaws, made significant mistakes along the way. He was incredibly violent and and wildly promiscuous. Or David. We know him as the boy who feeded Goliath or the man after God's own heart, the author of so many of the Psalms, but he's also the guy who committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
and then had her husband murdered to help cover up his tracks. A guy who's distinctly flawed. I don't know about you, but if I was making a list of of kind of the faith hall of fame, the members that would make up this great chapter, I probably wouldn't start with guys like that, right? On the surface, it just doesn't really seem to make much sense. But the author of Hebrews includes them for a reason. So why? I think it's to show us that faith can overcome failure. That in the midst of all the ups and downs in these men's lives, what we see time and time again is that God through his spirit, is in the business of using flawed people for kingdom purposes. The author of Hebrews here really is trying to communicate to his audience, who, if you remember, if you've been with us this summer, it's a group of people who are really struggling to even hang on to their faith. And he's trying to communicate to them that God can use you, that God can use anybody. He can use the broken you can use the ill-equipped, the, the messed up, even just average people. If you place your faith in God, he can use you. And I realize that even as I say that here this morning, that maybe there's some tension for some of us in that. that. That maybe even right now you're thinking, okay, that sounds good and all, but God can't really use me. Like maybe he can use that person, but he can't really use me. Maybe you think, you know, I, he must, you must not know what I've done. You must not really know where I've been. Or maybe you think, yeah, maybe someday, once I kind of figure this thing out in my life, once I maybe become a better Christian, start coming to church more, whatever that might be. So I think many of us, maybe even most of us, really wonder, could God possibly use me? Hebrews 11 shows us that he can and he will if we trust him. See, the truth is that God has placed you exactly where you are in your life for a reason. You might not understand it. You might not like it, but he has. He's placed you exactly where you are for a reason. He knows everything about you, everything you've ever done, everywhere you've ever been, and his love for you is constant, doesn't change. And sure, he he desires for you to to grow deeper in your relationship with him. He desires for you to understand more of what he's doing in in the world around you. He, He doesn't want you to stay the same, but he longs to make an impact in and through your life, in and through your faith, right here, right now, where he has placed you. So the purpose of this list in Hebrews 11 is not to point us to, to the amazing ability or to the greatness of all these people in the Old Testament. It's to show you that even despite your flaws, that God can use you. We also see in our text here that, that faith overcomes the unimaginable. Let's look back at verse 33. It says that these people do all these, these great things who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, which likely refers to Daniel, quenched the power of fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight, describing much of the book of Judges. Women received back their dead by resurrection, which we see in the ministries of the prophets Elisha and Elijah. See, at the center of of this long list, at the center of all these miraculous, seemingly impossible victories, what we see is faith. We see faith in the God of the promise. Now, this doesn't mean that their faith was always perfect, right? We tend to think that that good faith or a faith that God can use must always kind of be up and to the right, that it must just be always progressing, always getting better. That's not what we see on this list at all. Rather, we see a list of people who who really wrestled in their faith, a group of people who, who struggled, who questioned, who at times resisted, a group of people who oftentimes messed up. But just because God did great things through their faith doesn't mean that their faith was always great. I think sometimes they had just enough. They had just enough faith to hang on. Just enough to say yes to trusting God. One of my favorite examples on that list that we just read a moment ago is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they're thrown into a fiery furnace because they refuse to worship an idol set up by the king. And and they exhibit this this kind of say yes type of faith, where they choose to say yes to following and worshiping God no matter what happens. Here's what they tell King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. They say, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. 
For if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. If you know the story, you know that in the midst of their obedience, that God rescues them from the fiery furnace. We're told that they step out of the fire and they didn't even smell like smoke. See, by faith, they said yes. And God did something unimaginable. And it makes me wonder if maybe even right now, there's something that God is placing on your heart, that he's placing on your mind to say yes to. Maybe it's something he's been kind of nudging you toward for a while and you've doubted it or, or resisted it or questioned it. Maybe it's something he's, he's reminding you of that had happened a long time ago that he's pressing on, on you to say yes to, to trust him. Maybe it's something he'll put in your path later today or sometime this week. See, true biblical faith looks like saying yes to God and trusting that he will deliver you. But at the same time, still trusting him, even if he doesn't. This leads to the second thing we see in our text here today, that is an enduring faith. We'll pick back up here in the middle of verse 35, and my guess is when we read it earlier, you saw a pretty sudden change that happened here in the middle of that verse. It goes from all these great unimaginable things to some hard things. It says, some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute and afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth." I, uh, I played a lot of sports when I was growing up. My favorite sport always was football. I think I started playing football in fourth grade uh, and then became the quarterback in fifth grade of my youth football team. And I played on that team all the way uh, through middle school up until high school. And I wasn't great by any means, but I like to think that I was like at least kind of decent. Uh, but, but, uh, but then I got to high school. And I remember vividly the first day of football practice, my, you know, entering my freshman year, that summer entering my freshman year. And they divided us all up into our position groups. And so I went over here with all the different quarterbacks. And immediately I realized, I just don't really measure up. I didn't realize this heading into it all, but I looked up at those guys, like literally looked up at them because I was like six inches shorter than any of the other quarterbacks. I did grow a lot my freshman year, but at that point I was really short and I just realized like I'm nowhere near the athlete that any of these guys are. And just like instantly I felt completely out of place. I remember just feeling like unqualified, uncomfortable, unworthy. And I think in a somewhat similar way, we we, we might feel something like that when we come upon the verses that we just read. When we see what all these Old Testament saints had to endure for their faith, and then we look at our lives, or at least I look at my life, and I feel like, man, I just don't know that I measure up to that. Now, to be fair, I do think that being a Christian in our culture today, trying to follow Jesus is not easy. We're called in so many ways to go against the current, to, to stand out, to think differently than what we see in the world. And we certainly experience hard things. I'm sure that many of us in this room, even right now, are facing significant challenges. But my guess is that most of us probably haven't had to endure things like being arrested or tortured for faith. And so what is this second list, this this list of suffering for faith? What does that look like for us today? Tim Keller talks about how these two lists, both the list of triumph and the list of trial, really help us to see whether or not our faith is based on our desired circumstances and outcomes, or if our faith is based on our desire for God himself. Or as Keller puts it, whether we trust God to meet our agenda or to set our agenda. See, oftentimes, We don't think about the endurance of faith, I think because we're so conditioned in our culture to prefer a much more expedited version of faith, where God answers our prayers quickly and and correctly, where the issues in life, if we just trust God, the issues in life just kind of all go away and life is easy and comfortable and everything's good. But that's way different than what we see 
in these examples in Hebrews 11, isn't it? And it's actually also way different from how much of the world around us is operating. It's different than how my friends in Ecuador view faith. It's different than how a lot of our global missions partners in places like the Czech Republic and Turkey operate. See, we have so many distractions built into our lives, so many other things that we so often place our hope and our faith in to the point where when hard things happen in our lives, when God doesn't meet our expectations, that we're somewhat conditioned to just immediately doubt him, to question if he's real or if he's good, if he's even there at all. And I think sometimes we begin to question whether or not we had enough faith. But on staff here at Chapel Street now for about eight years or so, so I don't have the stories of you know, Jeff and Brian and Sterling, but in eight years, I've experienced enough hard situations where someone's diagnosed with a horrible illness, where a student's parents get divorced, where a young person takes their own life. And and so often what I've seen in, in response to those kinds of things is that people question the nature of their faith. We we ask questions like, did I just not pray enough? Or did I not pray for the right things? Did I not have enough belief? Did I not have enough faith? That's not what we see in Hebrews 11. What we see is a list of of broken people who through faith face hard things. And some, some see unimaginably great things happen like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But many face unimaginably difficult things where God doesn't step in and change their circumstances, where they have to experience significant hardship. And again, I'm sure that many of us currently in this room or maybe previously have experienced things just like that. But I think in both cases, the same thing is true, that the God of the promise is faithful. Because faith doesn't just mean believing the promise of God when things are good, It also means clinging to the promise of God to endure when things aren't good. Because our culture is so focused on achievement and wealth and more to the point where oftentimes I think we think that the goal of our faith is just to have more of it, to pray more, to, to believe more. That if something doesn't happen according to my plan, then, well, it's probably at least somewhat on me. But Hebrews 11 is teaching us something very different showing us that the goal of our faith is God himself. It's not on our agenda. It's not on our desired outcome of what we hope God will do, but it's on his truth and his promise. The author concludes talking about an enduring faith here in verse 38. It says, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. We know from Old Testament stories, people like David and and Elijah, many of the prophets in the Old Testament were forced to to flee and to hide in caves. These people had to suffer in so many tangible ways for their faith. And again, that's something that still is happening all around the world today. We oftentimes just don't see it in our little American suburbia bubble that we live in. I've been thinking a lot about this idea of enduring faith this week, and it's, it's really led me to, to reflect this week on my own faith, to, to, to really ask and, and consider what, what, what's at the center of my faith? What's at the center of your faith? Is it the center of my faith, my desire for certain circumstances or for certain outcomes to happen? Or is it on my desire for God himself, no matter what my circumstances look like? Would I rather have more of God or would I rather have more of God doing what I want to see God do? I hope and pray that that he would keep growing me into the kind of person who trusts him just as much if he doesn't as I do if he does. The last thing we see here in our text this morning is a perfecting faith. Verse 39. says, In all these, though commended, through their faith, did not receive what was promised. We'll pause there for a moment. You notice what he's saying here? He's saying that that all these men and women, though they are commended for their faith, though God used them to do unimaginable things, 
Though many of them had to endure significant suffering, they didn't receive what was promised. They believed that a Messiah would come. The whole Old Testament, right? The the promised land, the covenants, all of that is pointing to the coming of a Messiah. But they didn't know about Jesus. They experienced all of that, but they didn't receive the promise. They didn't know about the resurrection. See, we have the benefit in so many ways in the midst of both our triumph and our trials of being able to look back to the cross, to look back to the resurrection. Our faith can be instructed by the reality of what God did by sending his son. And they didn't have that, but yet they were still commended for their faith. And he continues on here in verse 40. It says, they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. The first many times I read that, I was confused. We, uh, we talked a lot about that this week in our preaching team meeting. And I think ultimately, here's, here's what he's trying to communicate to us. He's trying to say that the promise of God here really is twofold. That first, if you place your faith in Jesus, it means that when you die, you'll spend eternity with him. But that God's ultimate reward promised to believers has not yet been delivered. That it's not until Christ comes again that all who believe will be redeemed and made perfect. So the author of Hebrews here is really telling us that there's something incredibly communal about how our faith intersects with their faith. That when Jesus comes again, that we'll all be redeemed together with Moses and Abraham, even Jephthah. So how do we live in this in this in between? Right? How do we live in, in this already but not yet? I think first we cling to the promises of God that we've already seen played out in the person of Jesus. Right? We cling to the cross, to his love, to his forgiveness. We we find our hope in Christ in both the good things and the bad. But second, we look forward expectantly. We look forward to what God has not done yet, to the promises of what he promises to do when Christ returns. Which I think means that in the meantime, you'll have good days and you'll have bad days. You'll have days where faith comes easier and days where it doesn't. But in the midst of all of that, we know that just, just like those guys did all those years ago, that the God of the promise is faithful. I want to wrap up here this morning by, by telling you about my friend Cooper. Coop's a guy who's uh, it's been one of my lifelong friends. We grew up in the same neighborhood. Uh, and he's actually one of the guys that, that pulled me in and got me involved in the church when I was in middle school. His dad would literally just be on my driveway on youth group nights, and I'd didn't feel like I had a choice other than get in the car and and come to church. Uh, It's been a great example and a great friend to me for for many, many years. But uh, in March of of last year, 2021, Coop had had a seizure, uh, just a a random seizure that led doctors to quickly discover that he had a large tumor in his brain and something that's put him just on a crazy journey ever since. And Coop's Coop's always been a guy um, that I've been inspired by, but been encouraged by his faith He's always been a great example of of what it looks like to follow Jesus in my life. Um, But in the last year and a half or whatever it's been, in the face of just unimaginably challenging circumstances, what I've seen in Coop is a guy who's even more confident in who Jesus is. I want to read you something uh, that he wrote in one of his blog post updates a little while back. He says, I know that God has a plan and it's way better than our plan. Please pray for us to be obedient to his plan and not try to keep living out our plan every day. Also, please pray for his will to be done in our lives so that people can see God more clearly through us. It's more important to me that people see Jesus through my life than whether I live or die. I've reflected on, on his story and those words a lot lately, and I think I've really come to realize this, that that you can only say those words if you have firmly placed your trust in God, right? You You can only say those words if you have just such assurance 
that God has provided something better for you in Christ. But you can only say those words if you know that in the midst of, of both triumph and trial, that living by faith is absolutely worth it. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning just reflecting on the words we sang earlier, that, that you are good. And in the midst of both the good things and the challenging things, God, I pray and I ask that you would help us to, to continue to, to seek you, to see you, God, that we would understand more of who you are and what you're doing. Lord, I pray for those of us in this room that, that are facing significant struggle. God, I pray that you would comfort them and surround them with, with your spirit, surround them with people to encourage them and pray for them. Lord, we praise you for all the great things that we've seen you d- do in, in recent days and recent years. God, we praise you f- that you are good in the midst of, of the great things and you're good in the midst of the hard things. Lord, would you help us to, to trust you more, to see you more clearly. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Line options as well. Uh, receive our benediction this morning from Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's prayer for spiritual strength. I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.